Da. There it is. Wasn't that cool? Do I have bad breath? <laughs> Everybody's far away from me. I'm like, <laughs> it's okay. I'm not spraying. But it's good to be with you guys this morning. Welcome, welcome. I've been um, looking at myself and the way I do things lately. I'm not happy with a lot of different things. But... We live in the metro New York area, North Jersey, and it's fast paced around here. And a lot of times we're going through the motions and we're pushing and we're driving and we don't slow down long enough to think about what we're doing. And sometimes I'm like, I don't like myself when I get like that. I don't even like the skin that I'm in when I'm going that quickly. Every now and then a guy pops out of me that I don't particularly care for. Hopefully you can relate, but it happens with all of us. So what happens when you don't like what you're becoming? You know, what do you do? Like, if I was to talk to myself at this age and say, Charlie boy, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'd like to say, I'd like to be more kind. I mean, that's, that's something uh, I'd like to strive for. But we're amped up, and we're busy, busy, and we run, and we push. I wonder if we can go to a school of unlearning everything that we've been programmed with. You know, there's always a tension of where I am and where I want to be and where God wants me to be. And we, I think we have to take control of our mind because it all kind of starts there and slow yourself down. You know, to live better, we all need to slow down. Hurry is not from God. Think about, think about your relationships when you're in a hurry. We're rude, right? We're, we're, barely, we're rarely loving someone when we're in a hurry. And I know there's times when you have to be in a hurry. A woman's rushing to the hospital because she's pregnant. You know, times like that, there are instances when, yeah, we definitely need to be in a hurry, but we seem to be in a hurry all the time, and we're not very loving when we are in a hurry. We could be kind of rude. I know I can, and I don't mean to be. You know, uh, I don't like it when I'm like that. So I just started thinking, what would my ideal day off be? There's a lot of echo up here, guys. I'm not sure what it's from. Um, for me, it would be like to just really, really slow down. To wake up without the clock, forget the alarm clock. Uh, I'd like it to be sunny. I'd like it to be in the upper 70s, please. And, and perhaps maybe not waking up around here. <laughs> I'd like to wake up down the shore. I like walking on the beach. I like walking on the boards. I love hearing the waves roll in and roll out. That's so medicinal to me. You know, and that's a picture of God's grace. It's just wave after wave rolling into shore. Uh, I might have gotten there on my bike. Sometimes I need a little wind therapy, too. Um, and that's just one of my scenarios. I'd like to hook up with an old friend or somebody and just really chill out and have a really nice, healthy day, self-care day. For ladies, you know, you guys 
everybody has their own scenarios. Uh, might be spa day, man. And those days are cool too for guys and girls. You know, go, go over to a spa, get a massage, get a mani-pedi, get a facial. Facials are cool. Get your hair done. It's just You feel better after you do all that, don't you? You know, it's just something nice to slow it down. And um, you still have your problems, of course. And I guarantee you'll still have your problems after this 25-minute sermon. I'm not going to be able to do all that at one time. But um, at the risk of going against the culture, do you ever feel like you're just trying too hard? You know, I mean, we're, we're burned out. We're just, we're, they got us running like crazy. And even the Internet itself is addictive. It really is. They geared it to be addictive. You know, your iPhone came out, and then Twitter came out, and Facebook, and it's just run, 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 scroll, 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 scroll. You know, and even in church, the busyness of the church, you can get burned out. Those of us serving here can get pretty burned out. And then something happens, and then you start getting discouraged because, well, aren't my prayers working? They seem to be bouncing off the ceiling. Something's wrong. I'm doing everything right, but everything's going wrong. Why? Something's not working. And, and maybe it started, you know, for me, younger, mom brought me to church. Praise God for that. And then you do the altar boy scene. And, wow, that's cool, you know. And then later on, when I get my own church, I have, we did a youth lock in here. And those kids are now 20. And it's, it was such a riot. We did have a lock in Nazi guy here that was just crazy. And he was spoiling all their fun. So I kind of, you got to go. Uh, and, and we just, we, they had such a good time. Even now when we get together and that comes up, they start laughing and they start talking about the memories from it and they're cracking me up and it's just so good to see them doing it. But again, everybody that does grow up in church is pastors, kids, PKs we call them. I don't know if anyone here is a PK, but they're usually troublesome. Because I think what they see at home doesn't match what they hear in the pulpit, you know? And they don't, they listen to all the teachings, and it, at home it's inconsistent with what they see at church. And sometimes the parents or leaders in the church, they're working in the church too, and then they're fighting at home, you know, and fighting in the car on the way here. And the poor kids are praying and praying and praying, and no matter what happens, you know, it just doesn't seem to work. God, why didn't you answer my prayer? You know, mom and dad still got divorced. Yeah. It could be a couple that loves Jesus, and you come as a couple. That's awesome. You're doing everything right, and you're doing, hey, Pastor Chuck said pray together with each other before we go to bed or at night. You're doing all that, and you're serving in the church, and you lose your job. You know? Or the worst possible thing that can happen to any couple is you lose your child. It's horrible. You know, I've done those funerals. It's, it's, it's no words, but where is God? Where is God there, too, you know? might not be so dramatic. You might just like coming to church and you listen to Star 91 on the radio. Uh, we had George Flores here two weeks ago. If you don't know who George Flores is, he has been a Christian DJ for the last 25 years on Star 91. And uh, there was a station, WDJ, WDJ, that was an AM station. But he's been in the mix of the whole thing for a long, long time. But it seems to be a demographic market because George is now a little bit older and to push him out and they could hire somebody younger for half his salary, I guess, right? But he started, he continues his ministry on internet radio. But there's a, that K-Love station or K-Rock, whatever it is, 95.5. You might have the fish bumper sticker on your car or maybe you're a biker and you got the fish tattoo on your neck like my friend Chuck has. Uh, all of that, you might have all of that and you have a decent place to live and you got a decent car to drive in and you got friends, you go on your vacation, but you're still not happy. You're still not fulfilled. There's still something missing here. There has to be a better way than the way that we're doing things. So I would say if you're confused, if you're hurting, uh, if you're overwhelmed, listen to the words that Jesus said in John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And then Thomas, you know, they call him Doubting Thomas. I kind of like Thomas. Thomas says what other people wish they would say if they had the guts to say it. But Thomas just spits it out. Thomas goes... 
Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? <laughs> this is the A team. This is the apostles, the first string. They were just like us. They were people just like us. And then Jesus answered with a very important verse. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then he put a tag on it. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Wow. Let's pray for a minute. Lord, we thank you that we're together, and I thank you for the people here. And help us to just uh, open our minds and open our hearts, Lord. And may the Holy Spirit place your word in our hearts. And may we walk away this morning with something a little bit more than when we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, the way you do things seems to matter, and the way you say things definitely matters, right? You could say something in two different ways, and it could be interpreted in two different ways. You could do things in two different ways. You could do something, oh, I'm doing this, and it's nice and sweet what you're doing, or you can do it like, why, 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 why did they give me that, and you're all mad and angry? Or if you're married, as you know, you know, you could say, um, hi, hon, you wearing that tonight? Or you wearing that tonight? You know, I mean, it all depends on the way that you say something. And body language counts for 58%. Tone, 38%. That leaves only 7% for content. Now, this is an older study, but I, I use it when I'm doing premarital. You know, it, it's your body language, it's the tone, it's everything. It's the way that you say it. Now, as Christians, we always have searched after the truth. To steal a line from Chris Tomlin, there's a, there's a truth that goes beyond the ages that we have. That's what we have. And, and it's interesting because we're after the truth, and Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life and we know to experience that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free and that's true in all aspects of your life if you know the truth about finances you won't go crazy into debt if you know the truth about relationships it helps um, but we rarely seek after the way we, we go after the truth we go after the truth that's important but we often don't seek the way we rarely talk about the way of jesus now, does anybody here know what the first Christians were called? Because they weren't called Christians, and they weren't called Jesus freaks, and they weren't called holy rollers. Anybody know? There was a group in Antioch. They were called people of the way. That's what they were called. Way before it was Christ-like ones, right? So these world changers, uh, people that loved Jesus were called people of the way. Their goal wasn't right theology, and their goal wasn't really even strong morality. Uh, the, the Bible's filled with missteps of the patriarchs and, and moral failures all throughout the Bible. The strong theology and the strong teaching came in after Paul had a, the Judaizers, and there was the Gnostics coming in with all different teachings. So Paul had a, and this was the beginnings of the church, so Paul had to lock it down with some very strong teachings. But they were really, their goal was to live and love the way Jesus lived and loved. And if you think about the way Jesus lived and compare it to the way we live, <laughs> Jesus was full of joy all the time. We're full of stress and anxiety and, and, and uh, offense. You know, we get offended so easily. Uh, Jesus didn't worry so much. We're full of anxiety. I mean, we're, we're said to be the most anxious generation that there is, that there's ever been. And you can thank all our social media and every other thing that's going on because we're just roll, 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 roll. Jesus stopped for people. We just roll right by him, don't we? You know, we're too busy. We're too busy. We don't have time. Jesus was consumed with ongoing extended fellowship with his father. I don't know if it's because of social media or whatever, but the ADHD thing, whatever. I, I can't. If somebody's praying for me sometimes, I know I'm sitting there and I'm going, my mind is racing, going, all right, can you, it's over. Come on, I got to get on. You know, I'm thinking about where I got to go next, and I'm not. I can't pray for more than a few minutes without my mind thinking about something else. He always reacted appropriately for what the situation called for. <laughs> One of our greatest freedoms that we have is the way we react to things. But when we're hurried, let's face it, we snap at something. I mean, imagine if Jesus was like us. It's almost, you almost can't get your mind wrapped around it. It's almost impossible. I can imagine great crowds were following him. And I could just, you know, 
Oh, Peter, James, John, man, where are all these people coming from? Ah, I'm tired. I, I know I prayed with that one. I prayed, I prayed with everybody. I healed everybody. I fed them. And that leper guy, oh, my God, that guy smelled his body. Whoa. And, and, then, and then I put my hands, I touched him. Yeah, we told you not to touch him. No, I needed to touch him. And then he breathed on me, and he almost knocked me four feet down. Whoa. Imagine, you can't even think of it like that. You know, there's a verse that always makes me laugh. It's in Mark. It says, and when they found him, so they didn't know where he was. <laughs> they finally find him. Everybody's looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next town that I might preach there also. Jesus, everybody's looking for you. Good. Let's go somewhere else. You know? <laughs> I always, whenever I read that, I just, I can identify, I laugh. Can you see him scrolling through with social media and saying, that guy's got more followers than I got. What's going on here? I mean, you can't even put your head around it. When Jesus went somewhere, he took his time. He didn't own a pair of sneakers, open-toed sandals, feet got dirty. He was never running. We're always pushing it. I easily get overwhelmed, always rushed. Come on, we got to get there. Man, what if we're rushing to become someone we don't even like? Ouch. I, I think I told you, that, you know, they got, us such, they got us on that hamster wheel. But I think I told you last week I had an opportunity to spend some time with my cousin and his wife. And their daughter, uh, their child was getting baptized. We had a family dinner afterwards. And uh, it was so nice to be with him. I mean, this is my, when I was a little kid, this was my big cousin. And he was my sponsor when I received my confirmation, you know. And uh, so we go back a long ways. And even though there were a lot of people there, he said to me, come on, let's go outside. There was a porch outside this place, and um, let's talk. And we just started talking about when we were kids and our parents. And I mean, I was around his parents' deathbed. And there was so much interconnectedness. It was really good for me. It was good for me to slow down and do that with him. And it was good for him too. And when we got back inside, he goes, hey, I got an idea. How about Monday night meeting us in Hoboken at five o'clock at Court Street? And he goes, oh, let's have dinner. And I didn't answer him because I'm so wound up with the church. I just went, uh, you know, and then he said it again about five minutes later. And then all of a sudden it hit me and I said, you know what? Monday's my down day. You never know when you're going to get your moments again with family. I said, I'm in, man. Let's go. And I'm so glad I did that. I mean, both him and his wife are recovering. His wife just got done with her cancer treatment, so we have to see how that works out. And he had it. And again, it was just so nice to sit and slow down and be with people, you know. Uh, and we, we noticed that we were a lot more carefree and lighter back then when we were younger. But you get more responsibilities, you go older, and more things happen. But it just alerts me that I need to make some changes. Yeah. When in 2020, the group that we had that we were going to do Israel with, what a fantastic group of people that was. And I know what happens when you go over there because I've been there so many times. You will bond with the people that you travel with in a way that you never would hear because you're going to have some amazing spiritual experiences there. And we, I know the COVID knocked us out. I'm not negating the trip i will revisit it i'm watching to see when it's safe to do that again and try it again and we'll just try it again at some point but I, again i want to be more intentional about spending time with people especially my family too my brother his wife uh, you know there's a lot we're getting older you know friends are getting sick and family members are sick and people are killing people the world is going absolutely bonkers people are dying children are hurting you can hear them crying you know, I mean, do we practice what we preach? Will you turn the other cheek again? You know, and, and why, God? What's going on here? Got everybody questioning, you know, where's the love here? Where's the love? And people are discriminating when they discriminate. It only generates hate. It's all building up to a fever pitch. My mind tends to race a lot. And even when I'm go to the gym, which is my saving grace, even when I'm exercising, I'm full boat. You know, it's like a full on class. But then I took a Pilates class, slow, controlled movements. And at the end, you feel fantastic, and your mind is slowed down. I don't know if any of you take yoga or anything like that. I'm not into the spiritual part of that, but the stretching part and the calmness it brings is good. It keeps me centered. One of our online listeners, her name is Diane, and she's a friend of Doc Gary, a uh, friend of mine. And so she's a nurse, and she lives way down by Lincroft or Red Bank, maybe even further. 
She sent me a, what I call a pastor care package. I just got it last week. And I was like, okay. And I opened up the card, and there was a nice card in there. And then there was this book. And the book was called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. Anybody familiar with it? It's almost like a Winnie the Pooh thing kind of, but for adults. It was such a cool read because when I read books now, I'm not reading. I read for information. I've got pens. I've got highlighters. And I'm, you know, and I'm extracting information out that I could use with messages. It was so nice to sit there and just read these little nuggets that were placed with uh, diagrams and illustrations. And you could start in the middle. You could start at the end. Or you could start in the beginning. It didn't matter. And then she sent me a, there was a, a CD of like angelic music, which was just real <sighs> calming. I was very, so Diane, if you're listening again, thank you. And she even mentioned one of our sermons. So uh, what a nice lady. Thank you so much. One of the nuggets in the book was uh, the boy was talking to the mole and the fox, I think. And he said, isn't it odd that we can only see our outsides when so much happens on the inside? So it's all little things like that. You know, I look, I don't want to burn out and I don't want you guys burning out. I want us all to finish well. You know, and, and enjoy the moments that we have rather than rushing to can't wait till I get here. Then I can enjoy myself. No, <laughs> enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Stop and smell the roses, right? Uh, we said last week that we work so hard for God, we forget about God. And uh, you can work so hard for God, it can kill the work of God that's being done in you. The way, the way you're doing life, your schedule, your pace, it, it could destroy you. It really can. They're thinking about putting, there's a lot of psychologists that are thinking about putting people that are always hurried uh, as, as a listing in the DM book, the DM5 book, as, as an illness. We have to be careful with it. Um, now, we all have hurts. We all have hang-ups. We all have habits. Some are good. Some are bad, you know, and, um, and we live, and that's because we all live in a fallen world. But... I think instead of dealing with them, we distract ourselves by keeping ourselves busy. We hurry so much because we don't want to deal with something, and it usually goes back to a hurt that we had somewhere or a trauma. Most addictions are... One, one guy said um, he felt that addictions were unresolved grief at the base of them. And loss, you know, that's loss. Um, another person talked about trauma. Now, I've signed up for this class. I'm going to be a certified peer recovery specialist after 46 hours. But I'm going to learn a lot with this. I'm, I'm so glad I did it. Um, but all these insecurities, all unresolved hurts that we all have, all deep-seated fears we all have because of a fallen world that we live in. We all have them. And sometimes it just does well to take a little moral inventory, to slow down and just take an inventory. We, we get... When we do get a moment to rest, we get on online right away and we start scrolling and we're distracted by the drama on all the media and then we started getting attracted to all the trauma that's going on too. But that's how we do it. That's how the world does it. That's the way to success. That's the way to win. That's the way to get ahead. That's the way to be happy. You got to push it. You got to drive it. You play king in a mountain, right? When we were kids to achieve, you got to conquer you know, you got to get things and then you got to flex on them and show people you got them and put them on social media, you know, and, and that's what we do. In Proverbs, it says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Death of my health, death of a friendship or a relationship, death of me, <laughs> hypertension, heart attacks. Jesus has a better way. He said in Matthew 11 in the message translation, are you tired, worn out, you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. What a sermon title that is. I got to get one on that one. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. I love that. I just ordered a book called The Ruthless... I just got it, actually. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I was in such a hurry that I ordered the summary version. 
It's, you got to laugh. You know, I got to laugh at myself. But <laughs> I don't want to read the whole book. Just give me the cliffs, you know. And it works, though. I, I like the summary version. I don't know. <laughs> You'll probably be hearing some material from that. In the old translation, in the NIV translation of the same verse, it's the same thing but a different nuance. Let me read it. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, the, the yoke was a work tool. That's kind of weird. He's saying take a work tool. But it was a wooden piece, and then it had two loops. And it was never a single yoke. It was a double yoke. So they would put it around the animals. So one animal wasn't doing all the work. So you might have two oxen and the yoke would be there and the piece of wood would join them together. So they're working at the same pace and getting more done and not getting burnt out as fast. So I don't know if I'm tired, I'm worn out and all that. And Jesus is saying, take this work tool, <laughs> you know, this yoke. I'd rather hit the couch or get on the bike or something. But what he's really saying is he's inviting you to a better way to be joined with him, right? Not just believe in the truth, but believe in his way also to live like he lived. And you might be looking at me right now, like, Chuck, Jesus wasn't a single mom, you know? Jesus wasn't working two jobs. Jesus wasn't taking care of a house and this and this and this and this. And I, I know, I know. Jesus didn't work with my boss either. There's still a lot we could learn. I mean, he did have a pretty big mission. Son, I want you to go and be perfect. You're going you're to be born as one of them, but still one of us too. And you're going to be born from a woman. I want you not to sin at all. Be absolutely perfect. And you're going to die for the sins of the entire world. And it's not going to be, it's going to be very painful. They're, they're going to brutalize you. And when you think you can't take any more pain, it's going to get worse. But you will put everybody back in place with me. It will destroy sin, and our relationship will be back, and the Holy Spirit can come. I got this whole thing worked out. And Jesus like, I like the plan, Dad. I like it. Let's do it. And that's a pretty big assignment. Be perfect. Die for the sins of the entire world. I, I noticed he would disconnect from the crowd. He would get up while it was still dark, and, and go up on a mountainside and pray, but he would always disconnect for extended time with the Father. You know, he would take long meals with people. There was no, <laughs> there was no McDonald's, there was no Panera Bread, but we like Panera Bread, I know, but none of that was going on. They would make everything from scratch, and it was a big thing to have a meal with somebody. That food, that, that bread that you're, you're I'm nourishing my body, it's nourishing yours. We're becoming part of each other's life. That's why the Jew would eat with the Gentile back in the day. They didn't want to be defiled. But he also had deep conversations with people. It wasn't, how you doing, man? All right, how you doing? How you guys doing? All right. Off to the next. No, he, he stopped and he listened to people and he loved on people. There was a guy named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. People hated the tax collectors because they were Jewish and they worked for the Romans and they could install the tax on people and then they could tack whatever they wanted on for them. So they always overburdened. They put a big sum on and Zacchaeus being the chief tax collector, I got to think he had a lot of money. He probably lived in a big old house. And Jesus was coming through town and Zacchaeus was a little guy and he climbed up in a tree. He wanted to see. He wanted to see what all the commotion was. He wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus walked right up to the tree and said, Zacchaeus, come on down from there. And then he invited himself to dinner. I'm going to have dinner at your house tonight. Can you imagine a reaction from the people around knowing that that guy was a tax collector? Like, what? And even Zacchaeus' mind was blown. And he took him to the home. I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure it was a pretty big home. And Jesus spent time with him. They had dinner together. They talked and he was so moved by that conversation, he said, you know what? He completely repented. I'm going to give half of everything I own, and I'm going to pay back all the money, and then I'm going to pay back four times the amount of money. That's how much that one conversation changed this man's life. You know? Now, the Pharisees and all them, they didn't see it like that, so it would always be people that don't see it. I guess it depends on the, the heart. 
what's going on there. But again, Zacchaeus found that, yeah, Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. I want to tap into those unforced rhythms of grace that he's talking about. I want us to do that too. It seems like as Christians, everybody's so overcome. I'm overcome by temptation. I'm overcome by I'm exhausted, you know, and and I feel far from God. I don't feel like God's doing anything. I feel dull and spiritually dry. There's a place of unbroken fellowship with the Father that we need to find. We'll talk more about it in the coming weeks. And then with, we get unfocused. We get preoccupied. I can't even, (laughs) I'm, I'm windows into Chuck's life. I stop at a light. I'm checking my phone. I'm scrolling, you know, it's like, just relax. You'll get there at some point, you know, and put on the uh, do not disturb thing on your car so people can't call you and text you while you're driving. But we're distracted by stupid stuff. It's not even, it's like what they think, what they post, you know, what we have and what we don't have and the highlight reels and oh my Lord, none of that stuff lasts anyway. Remember what I said last week? We have too much rubble in our lives and we have to clear it out from time to time because it just keeps building up and building up and building up. And then something happens in the church and people get mad. You know, whether I did something or whether I get mad at one of you guys or whatever it is. And I, you know, I I let it go as soon as I can. But it keeps people out of the church for a long time. But Jesus said, follow me, not them. That's so important to hear. Because that's what kept me out of a church for a long time. I didn't like a particular priest, you know. But Jesus said, Chuck, 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 follow me. Don't follow him. Follow me. Follow me. So uh, it's, we tend to sit in a place where we regret the past and we're worried about the future and we're not present physically. And when we are present physically, our minds are somewhere else. Learn how to be present. Find a quiet spot. Close your eyes and breathe. And if your mind's still racing, focus on your breath. Focus on where it's going. And then put your mind on God. Focus on God. You'll see things start to shift. So if you're tired of the grind and tired of the stress and tired of being miserable, tired of being afraid, tired of being angry, tired of being anxious, too many problems to solve, too much weight to carry, too much pain to bear, too many decisions to make in one day, There's a better way, and it's not just the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Be still. Know that I am God. Be still. So we come to Jesus for what? He will give you rest, he said. I don't have to earn it. It's a free gift. You take his yoke, join with him, join together with him. Do life with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit guiding you. He is your personal mentor, your your own private PM. Another Chris Tomlin uh, line. I like, I like that guy. He, he said, he walks on the water, he talks to the seas, he stands in the fire beside you. It's true. Just come to Jesus, call on his name, and, and you'll find rest for your souls. Imagine hearing Jesus say that to you, and you will find rest for your souls. It's that Old Testament shalom, they call it. It's a lot more than just that little peace. This is what God wants us to experience. It's the promise of blessing. As I said last week, may the Lord bless you when I say that and be gracious to you and show you favor. And and might he keep you in all your ways, restoring the joy of your salvation when we mess up and planting you firmly on the road that leads to everlasting life. That's what was all about why Jesus came here. And as he turns his face towards you to grant you peace and your children peace, and especially in this time, you know, the, the times are troubled. Anxiety is at an all-time high, but the end is to have that blessing and to have that peace. Jesus said in John 14, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, my peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. And if we could just hear him saying that to us. I'm going to pray, and um, we're going to queue up something for you that I promised you last week. Let's bow our hearts. Lord, I praise you that you are a God of grace. I thank you that for even more for protecting me from forces around me, but you save me from myself. Let the knowledge of your grace, those unforced rhythms, 
never make me less, but only more intensely devoted to you. And we hate feeling weak and out of control, Lord. It doesn't work for us. Yet you told Paul that your power was made perfect in weakness. Teach us to go on. Teach us to cling to you, to change our mind about some things, and to depend on you in our times of trouble and weakness so that through you we can become truly, truly strong. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for everyone here. I ask a special blessing on them. And I pray that they don't worry. I pray that they bring, they find that happiness in their lives and the joy and they reframe whatever they're in. Just give them that attitude of gratitude. In your precious name, Lord, amen. Mr. Marley. Doop, doop. You guys could get up, man. It's cool. We're finished. There's Panera bread downstairs. There's coffee. There's tea. Or enjoy Mr. Marley. I just thought it'd be a nice way to end today. <laughs>